we'd like to welcome everyone to the Culture of Agriculture, brought to you by Spudnik Equipment here in Blackfoot, Idaho. I'm Brett Rigby, and I will be your host today. And we have got uh, the lovely Michelle Martin with us. Uh, she does Ag on Wheels and also has a, a magazine that you're doing. I think, I think I'll turn the time to you a little bit to kind of give <laughs> us an outlook or, or an explanation of all the things that you do and some of your hobbies, and, and that'll get us started. Absolutely. So uh, like you said, I own, my name is Michelle Martin and I have a show called Ag on Wheels and I also have an agricultural publication called Ag Mag. And I am from the Rio Grande Valley, all the way down in South Texas. You can't get any further south. And if you do, you're walking into Mexico. So <laughs> you're down where the rattlesnakes live. A lot of them, a <laughs> lot. And I don't do snakes. <laughs> no, well, I would, I would join you on that one. I don't do snakes either. So yeah, <laughs> but yes, in fact, Mexico is so close that I can literally walk over to Mexico. I live about seven miles from the border and my husband, um, actually, and a lot of our good friends farm right on the border wall. So we farm, we can see Mexico from our farm. From the farm. So what, uh, what does your husband farm? So my husband farms a lot of vegetables. He does a lot of exotic vegetables, napa, bok choy, parsley, kale. Um, there's even one, people are mind blown by this one, but it's called methy leaf. Not the drug meth, but it's, uh, it's an Indian herb. So it's almost like a cilantro, but it's for the Indian culture. And so we do a lot of exotics. He also works for Helena Chemical. He sells fertilizer, which we all know the fertilizer world right now. Oh boy. And um, he also ranches and he's all over the place like me. We're busy well. people. <laughs> <laughs> busy people. Well, that's good. Always on the go. Uh, family wise, any kids? Yes, I have one son and his name is Knox. And he is a survivalist and outdoorsman. That kid, if the world comes to an end, he's sticking by me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to know. It's good to have Yes, he is all boy. That is for sure. <laughs> well, he loves the farm then, if that's the case. Yes, he loves all things farm, hunting, and fishing. That is all him. <laughs> Well, he had shot his first deer by the time he was five, all by himself. And he has been deep sea fishing and caught blackfin and yellowfin tuna before he was six years old. Oh, wow. So, That's, yeah. That is exciting. Yes. <laughs> He's got a good record already. Yes, he does. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about your magazine. I, I uh, was able to go in and kind of view that. What uh, What are some of the things that that you put in your magazine uh, for the readers out there and, and probably give them a little idea of, you know, how to get a hold, get, get into that to be able to get to it. Sure. So I'll give you a little background. Um, I went to Texas A&M for all the Aggies out there. And uh, I changed my major five times. I just didn't know really what I wanted to do. And I did know that I wanted to do something as far as, um, I guess communications was concerned. And so my first job out of college was working at a news station. And my boss was extremely rude and told me that I just didn't have the looks or the voice to be a news reporter. And that basically it wasn't the job for me. So she put me in the back and I was an assistant producer for about a year and the hours were just too erratic. You know, I was 23 years old and I was going in at noon and I wasn't getting out until midnight getting paid minimum wage, which at that time, I think was like $7, somewhere around there. And so I left that place and realized, okay, I got to change what I want to do. So then I went and I worked for a school. I had a couple jobs in between, but that would take forever to talk about. So the last job was I worked at a private school and I did all their marketing, all their advertising, all their admissions. And it was actually a school that I had gone to when I was a child. And I was there for about three years. And about the third year, there had been some stuff that had happened that just made me extremely unhappy. And I remember looking up at the ceiling and saying, God, get me out of here. I need a new job. And I'm not exaggerating. And, you know, I'm strong in my faith. And at that time, just like that, I had the idea to start a farming magazine. And so I called my husband and I said, do they have a farming magazine here in the Valley? 
And he said, no, they used to, but they don't anymore. And I said, good, they do today. So I walked into my boss's office, put in my two weeks. I only had $200 in my bank account and went home and told my husband, I quit my job. I'm going to make this work. And as you can imagine, he was not happy because we were in no financial position for me not to be able to work. <laughs> and, so, and we had just bought a home. So he was not happy with me. But basically what I did is um, through some previous jobs, I had some connections and I called one of my friends who's a graphic designer. And I said, listen, this is my idea. You want to jump on board? And he said, sure, not a problem. So I went on Google, got all these fake, you know, not fake, but all these already published articles. And I made a fake or a mock magazine. And then I had my husband drive me around to all the agricultural businesses and ask several people, this is what I'm going to do. This is an example. Will you invest in me? I had four advertisers. I only had four people say yes. And I went to probably 25 or 30 people. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so my first magazine that came out in 2000, I believe it was 2014, was um, only 24 pages, all articles and only four advertisers. And then by the second one, it it just skyrocketed. I guess people um, just, I found a niche. People were extremely supportive in the agricultural community and the rest is history. And here in September, we will be starting our 10th year. Oh, man, that's exciting. That's uh, yeah. got some... well, ninth year. I'm not good at math. Ninth, ninth, yeah, ninth year. year. <laughs> ah, next year will be the 10th year. It's coming. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> good articles you don't have to count see that <laughs> yeah and then like as far as I know you said like what what articles and whatnot are in there so basically I wanted to bring awareness to agriculture I feel like there's such a huge disconnect between the consumer and the grower or anyone that's involved in agriculture and so basically the magazine covers all aspects we're going from farming we're going to ranching we're covering the 4-H and FFA for the kids and we're covering a lot of the legal stuff like the farm bill and, you know, any scientific new findings, any new fertilizers. I mean, you name it, I try to put it in there. Well, very good information to the grow for the growers and like you say, the community. I think yes, that's sir. probably one of the big things that uh, as I've been in agriculture ever since I've been just young, I've noticed that uh, the ag, ag sector is actually shrunk you know, as far as population when you start to look at how many are actually involved in it and how many start to get away from that and not understand what we're actually doing so mm -hmm. we appreciate you doing that magazine <laughs> to kind of help on that side too because along Thank with you. that if they can read some of that they understand what we're doing so yes absolutely and that kind of leads me into um when you say you know if they want to read and, you know, if we're honest in today's society, people's attention has gone from here to here. <laughs> and so I remember it was about the sixth year um, I was driving in my car and the magazine, you know, after six years, it was, it was doing really well and it was pretty much running itself. And I'm extremely ADHD. And so I was getting bored and I said, you know, not a lot of people are really into reading anymore. Let's put a visual so we can cater to the ones that read and then we can cater to the people who like the visual aspect. And I said, let's do some videos. And in every edition of my magazine, I try to feature a local farmer, grower, rancher, or an ag business. And so that's how, kind of how I started out with the show is I said, okay, we're gonna feature the farmer that I put in my magazine, we're gonna make a video on them. And that's kind of how that spiraled. And again, I used some people that I had worked with in the past. Well, that did not go as planned <laughs> by any means. You know, I think um, for me, I, I'm more of a, I have to fail to learn. And that's, I fell flat on my face. Um, I had the mentality that the show was going to be as successful as the magazine was in the same time frame, And that wasn't the case. I was struggling really hard to find people to, uh, I guess, sponsor the magazine or advertise rather in the show. Um, and it was mind blowing to me because everyone watches TV, everyone streams. So I'm thinking, why are these advertisers wanting to do their commercials? Yep. You know, and I ended up putting my family in $60,000 worth of debt. Oh, man. Yeah. 
because you think about it, you have to, I had to pay my production team. And then when it was airing on this, our local ABC channel, I had to pay them every month. And so I was pretty much throwing out anywhere from 10 to 15 grand a month. Just, just, just for, and getting nothing show. in return. Yeah. Yeah. And so I remember my husband sitting me down and him saying, you got to stop. Like we, there's, how are we going to pay mortgage? You know, you drained us. And it was at that time, again, I looked up and I was like, if it's meant to be, you know, God, you'll show me what to do. And within the next week, I said, you know what, I'm just going to shorten it and I'm going to hit the YouTube sector and I'm really going to get started on Instagram because as I like to call it, the adgram, you know, anyone in agriculture on Instagram <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Um, it skyrocketed. It just started to take off. And I think the uh, wide diversity of vegetables we have here in the Valley kind of helped with that because um, we have over 50 varieties of vegetables that are grown down here. And so I think people were just fascinated. And then from there, then it just started going and going. So yeah. Well, that, that is neat that you kept it alive. That's <laughs> It was scary. It's still scary. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> well, it's not all fun. I've decided anything in ag can kind of be scary. <laughs> yes. It's a gamble, you know? And I, I truly feel like if you, if you believe that, you know, in your business and you believe what you're doing is right, then you'll find a way to make it work. And yes. I've gone through a lot, you know, when I started the show, my mom passed away. I'm an only child. My parent, my dad passed away a long time ago. So my mom was my last living relative and she died while I was pregnant with my son. I'm trying to run these businesses and it was a lot. I mean, yeah. And to have, and then to have things not kind of falling into place the way they need to be. So uh, it's, it, it comes back to, you need to stick with some things and work through it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And I'm just so passionate about it. I knew I couldn't stop. I knew I had to just keep going. And, you know, through all that turmoil, they even told me my son had leukemia at one point, which he did not. That's its own story. But there was all these things that are happening. And it's like, you can either stop or you can keep going. And I decided, you know what, I love agriculture so much. And without anyone involved in agriculture, we're not going to have much, you know, and so we need to bring awareness to that. And so that's kind of what kept me going through it all. Well, and that's great. That's a great story to <laughs> give somebody else also the opportunity to know if they're not, if everything's not working quite right, you can still make it work. Yes, you can. You just got to be patient and you just got to take a different route. You do. You do. And, and you know, that's what, I, that's what I always have said. It's interesting about the agricultural world is it seems like when we come up against something, which seems to be, you've heard the common phrase, oh, you know, we'll get back to a normal year. I don't know that we ever have a normal year. <laughs> and no. with that, we have to, we have to kind of skirt different issues and, and work through different things. And, and you've proved that that's a good way to go. So. <laughs> yes. And you know, you say a normal year. So here where I live in the Rio Grande Valley, it's hot. It's really hot. And they used to call it the magic Valley because um, of our, you know, our, our weather, the soil, it was just known to be very uh, luscious with everything that was grown here. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it was 2020, maybe 19. I can't remember exactly, but we had a freeze. We never get below like 55 or 40. It ruined everything. And then shortly after we got a hurricane. So you talk about double whammy. That was rough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, double dose of everything. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. You get down in that southern part of the area, you're not used to a frost like that. Mm -mm, not at all. I don't do cold. I am strictly <laughs> warm nature. <laughs> so with that, with those issues that they ran into, what kind of were some of the things that you found with the growers down there that they dealt with and that they were able to come through that type of a hit? You know, there's it kind of reverts back to what I was telling you about my story is they just kept going. You know, a lot of these vegetable growers down here, a lot of vegetables are not insurable. And so they didn't, you can't get insurance on them. So what can you do? You know, you just got to dust the, or brush the <laughs> dust off your shoulders, however that saying goes. And that's what they did and kind of found a new path and picked up where they left off and now things seem to be going good and as far as like the citrus 
whenever we got that freeze and that hurricane, it affects the bloom for next year. So although they had lost the crop or the majority of the crop the year prior, it still affects the year coming forward. And it takes about three to four years for it to recover. To get that back. Mm -hmm. And so basically, I mean, what can you do? You just got to keep going. Yeah, that's and that's a pretty good hit when in today's agriculture where margins are tight. Oh, very tight. <laughs> yes. So, yes, sir. What uh, give maybe explain a little bit on the ag on wheels. That's probably I've looked at that uh, with, okay. with where you go out and you visit different areas and different growers and and uh, kind of share different aspects of agriculture. Sure. So with the ag on wheels, like I said, I just came up with that idea, you know, as I was driving and really it's kind of spiraled into sharing someone's story. I'm fascinated by meeting people. I feel like everyone brings something to the table and everyone that I film with impacts me in some sort of way. But um, it started out local and I had the bright idea. I said, you know what, let's just start traveling. Let's go here and let's go there because there's so much more agriculture. And I think that there's also a misconception uh, that if someone doesn't farm the way the other person does, then it's wrong. But, yep. you know, you run into that a lot. And I think that I wanted to bring awareness that just because someone does it differently doesn't mean it's wrong. It's what works best for that operation. Mm -hmm. And every operation that they do is just so crazy. I mean, I've been to Colorado where they were doing onions in Olathe, um, New Mexico, Illinois, Kansas, North Carolina, and the families I get to meet are, it's just, it's so great. It's something I can't even put into words because you see how passionate these people are. And that's why they're in what they're doing is because exactly. of that passion, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I think um, I just got back from North Carolina and what I have never seen is cucumbers. You know, it was in Mount Olive, North Carolina, and they grow for Mount Olive pickles. And that whole process just fascinates me. It's insane. <laughs> totally different than what you've been out and seen. Yes, exactly. The only, I will tell you, the only similarity is they rely heavily on um, hand labor. And I saw tobacco as well, and they were doing a lot of hand labor. And here in the Valley, the majority of vegetables are all hand picked. And so but that was a similarity, but everything else was completely different. Different. Yeah. Which is, which is very interesting as far as what did you, uh, we've talked a lot about labor in the past. What did mm -hmm. you see down there? And what are you guys experiencing in your area as far as labor is there shortages? Is is everything good that way? Or are you yeah. having struggles? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a trick question because I don't, I want to play neutral here, you know, but um, so living so close to the border, it really labor has never been an issue for us. Um, and a lot of the workers, you know, they would come over for the day, they would work and then they'd walk right back over or, you know, go over. Well, here in the last couple of years or so, we've noticed a dramatic change because of our administration. So these people are coming over and they're not wanting to work. And then the ones that were working and were doing it the legal way, so to speak, um, they're upset. And now they don't want to work because, you know, they invested all this time and money to do it the right way. And so it's becoming extremely hard. It's almost impossible to find a good helping hand. And so we might have to participate in the H2A program, which we've never had to do wow. uh, living so close. And it's difficult because like I said, with us growing over 50 varieties of vegetables in this area, we rely on labor a lot because we can't use all this equipment because they're so sensitive. And so what's a farmer gonna do? Go hand pick 10,000 acres of his own vegetables? It, it doesn't work that way. So, it does not happen. <laughs> no, and I know a lot of farmers who have actually cut their production almost in half because they just can't find the labor. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. So that's where, you know, we, we need to start coming up with new equipment again, huh? <laughs> yeah, get on it, man. Get on it. <laughs> And, you know, we do potatoes down here, but there's only like, I want to say two to three farmers valley wide that grow potatoes in this area. And when I did um, North Carolina, I got to see sweet potatoes. 
which is an interesting crop, isn't it? Sweet, sweet potatoes is not quite the same as a potato. That's right. <laughs> it handles different. It, oh, I, that's, we, we've even kind of played in the sweet potato equipment side a little bit, but due to the bruise and just the way they're, they, they handle them so much differently, that's something that, that we've got to work on as well if we jump in that one very deep. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, that's something with that on wheels that I love seeing is like just all the differences, but really getting to learn more about the crop and how much, you know, like, let's say, for instance, your company has to know about a crop so you can cater to that grower. And there's just so many little facets and aspects of everything that people just don't think about when it comes to farming it's crazy that's right you, you drive down the road and you look out and you see the combine going or the planter going and you just think ah oh, everybody does it that way <laughs> yeah because that's the big side i mean corn soybeans wheat you know the grains and stuff like that there, there's a lot of that being done nationwide and yes. you get into these specialty crops and it's uh it, it takes a lot different mentality to kind of think through that as well and also, there isn't stuff just readily available to uh, jump in and say, this works and we can make it just go because it, it covers everybody. Yes. It goes back to what you were saying. Each operation is a little different. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Absolutely. Yeah. And here in the Valley, you know, we're year round. So you get into, let's say, the latter part of August. In fact, we planted early this year, but the latter part of August until about April, you have all your vegetables and specialty crops. And then we go into watermelons, cantaloupes, and then your row crops, your grain, corn, cotton, all that good stuff. We yeah. are year round. We don't stop. We don't get breaks. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why you have to slip away and go fishing once in a while, just during the week. To, you know. That's right. <laughs> we all say that. <laughs> uh, what, what a, you talk about cucumbers. What are some of the other most interesting crops as you went around and visited with uh, growers? What would you say some of the more interesting as far as planting and harvesting and all that kind of stuff that you, you've experienced? Well, I will say um, I liked the green chilies when I went to New Mexico. That is something that, you know, you would think living so close to Mexico, we would have that, but we really don't down in this area. So to see that, that was really fascinating. And I think one of my favorites, and it was here local actually, was the sugar cane. And oh. so we have the only sugar mill in Texas in our area. And so I got to see the sugar cane being planted and it's a long crop. I mean, it's in the ground for almost a year. And then I got to see the harvest. And then after the harvest, they took me to the sugar mill and I got to see the whole process of how they make your table sugar. And let me tell you, I will never take sugar for granted ever. <laughs> I put a whole different perspective on it. Yes. But you know, to see that field, we do burns here still, they were still allowed to do them. So to see that sugar cane field burn is something that I think everyone should have the opportunity to see how quick it goes, you know, all the factors that play into it. You have to make sure your wind speed is fine, the temperature, you know, you can only burn between a certain amount of time. And then the whole process in the mill is insane. Wow. So they burn the field off and then harvest it. Yeah. So basically what they do is, and here's something interesting is so the blocks are about 30 acres they're just square acres i don't think they go more than 40 i think that's the max mm -hmm. but there's several fields of them and they'll get this tractor and it has this like torch at the end and they'll play this sound and there's an episode on it on my youtube but it'll play this sound and it says if anyone's in the field you need to get out now and they'll play in english and spanish well a lot of times if we have illegal traffic and they're hiding in the field they think it's just a ploy to get them out. And so we actually have to really look to make sure that no one's in the field. Ooh. And then this tractor goes through with the torch and he lights it just in a square, just like that. And then it all gathers in the middle and it takes about total 10 minutes. And then the field's done being burned. Oh man. Yeah. It's quick. Yes. And so then after that, they let it cool down and then they bring in their sugarcane harvesters and they get all the stocks and then they take it to the mill. Wow. So do the growers own the equipment or is the company own the equipment that comes in and does that? 
so the sugar mill actually owns all their equipment as far as like the burn and all that good stuff they're harvesting equipment and which is interesting because i've never seen a sugarcane harvester and those are pretty they're pretty big <laughs> yeah they are right i've seen the harvester but didn't realize that they burned so that's very interesting to <laughs> yeah it's extremely and they have a big water truck and a, it's it's a whole production it's really amazing to see we need the water truck once in a while when we cut grain when it takes off. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone needs a water truck now. I mean, we're so short on water over here. Yeah. Uh, so are you are you having some water shortages down in your neck of the woods? Big time. We are in a severe drought. And as you can imagine, vegetables require a lot of water. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, there started, I believe, two weeks ago or maybe a week ago, they allocated our water. So we're on restrictions and so they, are you, you know, are you pumping the water out of the ground or out of a canal system? What so all going? of our water comes from the Rio Grande River. Okay. The majority, and then a lot of it's through wells as well. And we do a lot of drip irrigation and flood. What you won't see here is pivots. We do not have a lot of pivots. Very few farmers use pivots here. But I suppose a little bit of that, that has to do with the evaporation of the of the water trying to get to the ground. Yes, absolutely. And just our soil too. It's just, we, yeah. what works best for us is blood and drip. Oh, man. If you got the money, we use drip. If we, if we're short on funds, we use blood. We so. use the blood there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's, we, we're kind of in the same boat as far as drought wise. Uh, we've been a little short on water here in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I was just out in the on the coast out in Maine last week, and they're actually a little drier than normal. So they were hoping some rain would come. So it's interesting how different areas have had more more rain and more moisture, and some areas haven't had enough. So yeah, and I hate to say this, and we've all talked about it, and I don't want to jinx it, but we're all saying, "Gosh, we wish we could just have a little baby hurricane, just a baby, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> maybe a tropical storm." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> because we we do need the rain. But, you know, we work with what we got and we got some rain yesterday. So we're thankful for that. So that's that is good. That yes. is. How is Maine? I'm supposed to go to um, Maryland. You say Maine, but I'm supposed to go to Maryland sometime soon. And I'm excited for that one. Oh, Maine's beautiful. I you get out there. And of course, it feels like I keep teasing them out there. It feels like you're uh, harvest, you're growing potatoes in the middle of uh, our our island park which is more of a you know tree recreation area so <laughs> and in the fall when you go out there to to harvest the colors are just brilliant but uh, that's what it, i hear i have to go back to north carolina in october and i'm looking forward to seeing the change because we don't have that here all we have is palm trees yeah palm trees and mesquite trees <laughs> <laughs> but you won't see palm trees out there <laughs> no they don't quite no. make it so you yeah. know what's funny is we have palm tree farms here and a lot of these growers who are growing vegetables, they have palm trees in their fields. It's, oh, wow. It's and just it, normal. That's just a normal thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's very interesting. So yeah. does, so when you say palm trees and they're grow, are they growing them to sell to like? Some of them do. Homeowners or different industry? Yeah, some of them grow palm trees, you know, for nurseries or for mm -hmm. the palm industry. And then others, they're just naturally on their fields and they're pretty to look at <laughs> yes they are i we have to go south to get to that point <laughs> yes you do very south <laughs> uh, what uh what are some of your goals i mean are some of the, the i guess i'm asking the question what are some of your aspirations to see or look into the ag deal going forward. I, you've had so much excitement to get here, you, obviously because of some of the things that you've had to go through <laughs> and the work that you've done. What what are some of the stuff that you're kind of looking in the future that you think that that you need to do to kind of help or what as an ag industry, we need to kind of do some things to portray what we're doing and give people an idea of what's happening. Sure. Um, I think that, you know, everyone always asks, what are your goals in the next five years or so be it? Honestly, I would like to be at a point, you know, since I'm pretty much self-funded, I want to be at a point where I can have a full documentary show or whatnot um, on, I guess, 
I don't want to say Netflix, but on some kind of streaming service aside from YouTube um, to really tell the farmer's story because I honestly feel that farmers have lost their voice or anyone, I shouldn't say farmers, but anyone involved in agriculture has lost their voice. And to be able to give their voice back to them, I want to be the vehicle that does that. And in today's society, I feel like even if they do want to tell their story, they might be kind of nervous to do it because of the backlash. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be the person that can kind of be their, their armor, I suppose. I'll take the heat because I, I feel it's so important to tell their story, to let the world know. And a lot of times, like I'll go into our local grocery store and on my Instagram, I'll ask people random questions like, do you buy organic or conventional? and have them answer and try to educate them because there's so much misinformation out there. And so in the, my goals and aspirations are to be able to become more known to tell the, the story of agriculture and to alleviate some of that stress that maybe the people of agriculture have, you know, and some of that fear and to give them their voice back and to give them their opportunities because it's hard. It's really hard in today's world. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. I, I think that uh, in the ag world, we're, we're working so hard to keep everything flowing and trying to survive on, on the side of production that mm -hmm. a lot of times we lose that site that we need to try to help everybody else understand what we're doing. I think a Netflix would be really good. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what's interesting, and maybe your listeners will find this interesting. So today's world you have to pay people to air your content so for instance like on our local abc channel i was having to pay them even though i was already paying for the production and everything else i had to pay them to air my stuff which i just think is crazy yeah. you know like you're giving them content mm -hmm. and if they believe that it's good why am i having to pay <laughs> yeah. which is crazy but i you know if that's the way it's gonna go eventually over the years i want to be in a financial position where i can say fine here take my money but tell this story because it's that important to me so well and i think uh, i think there's a lot of people that would be right on board with you that are in the ag ag uh, population that would definitely want to join in with that yeah absolutely and you know rfd um, the Ranching and Farming Network, uh, yep. they found me on Instagram. And basically, we came up with a deal where I give them clips of my show, not the whole episode, but clips, and they air it on their market research on Wednesdays on their show. Mm -hmm. And I don't pay them, they don't pay me, you know, they get the content, I get the exposure, and it's a win win. Mm -hmm. So you got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. I, uh, I definitely think that uh, that's something going into the, into the next foreseeable future in ag is, is to get that word out. I think the part that you go into the supermarkets and you're starting to see where that produ produce comes from, uh, being able to, to help on that. I think we've got a lot of people working that direction, you know. You know. You say that, and I started something, and we're about to start it back up. It's called Farmer Who, mm -hmm. and we actually started it on watermelons right when COVID had started. So what was that, 2020, right? 2020, yes. Oh, my gosh, first time gone. <laughs> so basically, it was a sticker, and the sticker was on the watermelon, and it said Farmer Who, and it had a QR code. So all you would do is just put your phone up. You didn't even have to download an app or anything. You just put your phone on that QR code. And then a one minute video popped up with me and the farmer that grew that exact piece of produce that you were holding. And so that kind of gave that transparency, you know, to the retailer or to the consumer, hey, this watermelon was grown in New Mexico or whatever. And then COVID hit and we kind of had to pause the brakes. <laughs> Yeah, because that kind of took away from anybody showing up in person. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, we were already in the works to, you know, start that up again. And our goal is to put it eventually on, you know, your all your vegetables, onions, cilantro, watermelons, your fruits, your meat, your chicken. So it's a big goal. It's a big project, but we're working at it. Yeah, I and I think it'll pay dividends in the long run. I think people want to know. And, and plus, if uh, I've even seen you know, a couple of places that even had a video of the farm that uh, it came from, you know, and I, yeah, people want to know where the food comes from anymore. And instead of just the store, they kind of figure out that, Hey, it does come from a farm and it, and it's a lot of work to get to that point to get, get that out to them. So. 
Absolutely. Oh, I, I commend you on doing that. That uh, I think that's something that needs to continue. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I like to stay busy. What can I say? <laughs> uh, well, one of these days, we've got to get you out west here, see? And then that way we can put you in a potato field and a sugar beet field here in Idaho. <laughs> Let's do it. You let me know when. I'll be there. Oh, well, oh, I will. <laughs> let's get ready. We're just getting ready to start harvest. So that's a good I'm time. ready. <laughs> uh, um, what, uh, as far as uh, you were talking a little bit about the farm bill and a few things like that, uh, what's your take on some of that? that you visited with on the farm bill right now. Do you have any good in, insight or information that you'd like to share that you visited with some of these guys? Um, you know, that's a great question right in there. I just think that the government is making it almost impossible for the world of agriculture to succeed. And if you're not born into it or you're not married into it, good luck. Cause yeah. you're not getting into it, you know, unless a miracle happens. Cause the way that it's going, it's getting really, really rough especially with the water issue and the eminent domain that's going on. It's insane. Yes. Well, and, and like you say, the cost of production to jump in, get the ground, get things going. It, it is a, it's a difficult. Every once in a while you will run across the person that has jumped in and, and made it work. Yeah. But not very often. Yes. Yeah, not very often at all. <laughs> yes. 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 So, well, is there anything you would like to, to kind of add to our conversation today? No, you know, I think we we covered a lot. I just think that, you know, I don't know the demographic of who listens to this, but I think that we really need to just bring more awareness to agriculture. And we've really got to motivate the younger generation to become involved because I was speaking with an ag teacher this last weekend and he's saying, we really just don't have kids who are interested in it anymore. And if we don't have a younger generation of farming, where are our farmers and ranchers going to come from? That's right. You yeah. know, we're not, can't, we're already one, 1 1.2 or 2% of the world. I mean, we can't really afford for it to get lower. <laughs> no, we can't. We got to start growing instead of going backwards. Yeah. As and we... so I think that, you know, agriculture in general, it's one of the hardest jobs that anyone could ever do. But at the same time, I think it's one of the most rewarding and, you know, anyone involved in it is so selfless because they're completely giving everything they have to the world, even to people that they don't know. And we take it for granted. And so every time, you know, you take a bite of food or you put your clothes on or even sit at a table, I mean, everything revolves around agriculture. And so I just think we need to give some more recognition to agriculture. And so... That's my two cents. <laughs> well, that's a good two cents. We need, yeah, we definitely need some excitement on the other side of bringing in some good young farmers and, and uh, you know, and, and I, I've seen some, some change a little bit over the years. Um, I think it was really going away from having the, the dads or the families that were farming. A lot of times they would uh, kind of push their kids to something else just because of kind of the sick of circumstances that ag was going mm -hmm. through. I kind of feel a little different here the last little bit that maybe we're getting a few more that want to stay now. Uh, they're promoting, you know, to stay here. So hopefully that will continue. Fingers crossed, right? Let's oh boy, yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to tell you how much we appreciate you joining us today um, and being with us and sharing your insights and uh, also some of the perspectives and what you're doing. So uh, again, thank you very much from, from us here at Spudnik. Uh, that's one of the things that we, we want to do with this podcast is uh, to, to make some awareness of different things, not just just potatoes and the potato equipment that we do. We want to we want to put out that uh, you know agriculture's got a lot of different avenues that need to be taken care of, and we need to keep pushing pressing forward. So, absolutely. Thank you very much, Michelle.